All right, everybody, we have Lloyd Butch Keezer. Lloyd Butch Keezer grew up in just outside of Baltimore City. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. And went to the U.S. Naval Academy, two-time NCAA All-American, served our country, at the same time was winning Olympic medals, world medals, and had the opportunity to work with Butch with the national team. an interview because I, I'm just fascinated with his story and I had a chance to speak with you a few weeks ago and got a glimpse into some things that I just I've known you for probably 10 years and some of those things you just they don't come up in conversations and right, right. So, uh, thank you for thank you for taking the time out of your Sunday morning how's it going um, it's going well I mean as well as can be expected during these uh, coronavirus time and um, this is kind of a good way of getting out too, even though it's not physically out. <laughs> it's exactly. a connection to the outside world and getting to see, you know, somebody like you who is a good friend of mine. And it's just it's really good good time to be able to be here and chat with you. Yeah, appreciate. It. I like your the backdrop of, of your uh, your Zoom. You get the piano and some beautiful pictures back there. Well, folk, my wife loves, to, uh, she's a photographer. So a lot of the stuff, uh, we've been to those places there and she'll look at these things, look like this old beat up um, patio or a pier. And I want that. And next thing you know, <laughs> it's up on the wall and it's just beautiful. It takes you to another place. And a piano, like I shared with you earlier, um, I always loved the piano. I don't play, my wife plays. So I always dreamed that when I grew up, I'm gonna have a grand piano in my living room. And that's what's back there right now. So it's a conversation gorgeous. piece for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And that looks like Annapolis in one of those pictures. Is it? Is that a pier in Annapolis? No, that's up in Burlington, uh, Vermont. Oh, um, Burlington. You know, like yeah. Mm -hmm. I was. Uh, I went mountain biking there mm -hmm. um, on Killington a long, long time ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And the um, other photo above that pier there is... Um, um, out there in Glacier National Park in uh, Montana. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And now we're back here in uh, gorgeous D.C., Maryland, Virginia. You were in Virginia, is that correct? Right, Northern Virginia, a place called Ashburn, Virginia, about 10 miles north of um, Dulles Airport. Virginia. Yeah, so you're not far from me, uh, and I didn't realize that. I okay. maybe I knew you lived in Virginia, but I didn't realize you're so you did live that close to me. Okay. At the, but uh, do you get back to Annapolis at all? Have you been in touch with any of those guys? Um, only through the phone um, for the past, you know, coronavirus time. But but typically over the years, I've been doing the wrestling clinics there. Um, I would do three sessions, one each week. Um, evening session and pull all the campers together to different, you know, uh, groups. And I would do like a two hour session, um, hour and a half of technique. Um, I throw them around and throw me around and show them what worked for me. And then after I do like half an hour motivational talk and I bring medals and rings with me and they get a chance to touch it and feel it. And then I have a bunch of posters and um, card trading cards. They line up and, um, I sign them and they buy posters and I take photos with them and all that kind of stuff. So that's during the summer. And then I periodically get up there and watch a match, uh, try to get out to their nationals and, and watch those. And I kind of follow them through um, um, amateur wrestling news, and Washington Post, uh, et cetera, from, from afar. And every once right. in a while I would pop in, pop my head into the room, for, you know, each year just to say hi and, and kind of share a little bit of my story about, you know, how, um, I was like the little train said, I think I can, I think I can, and here I am. <laughs> and, they, and they still are at that point. I, I know, uh, you know, Carrie has a nice recruiting class yeah, coming yeah. Mm -hmm. in. And how, how do you feel about that, Coach Kolak coming in? Um, I, I feel really good about it. You know, when I coached the Fargo team back in 2010, he had coached it prior. And so um, um, I got a chance to pick his brain. So he came up, you know. Um, mm -hmm spent a couple of hours with me in a little restaurant and I was just really impressed with him, you know, with um, his comprehensive knowledge of the sport, his um, comprehensive plan he had put together for training the Fargo team. So I said, can I use that? I said, yeah. So I used it and tweaked it to our team and some things I think I needed to be there. And, and um, 
he just seems to be a um, no nonsense guy, you know, just a uh, straight shooter. Um, and all the things that I look for um, in a wrestler, he has those and he tries to instill that in other guys, you know, about, uh, I know being um, physically fit, um, fundamentally sound, um, aggressive, and um, make the other guy beat you, not beat yourself. And when our team um, wrestled against his teams, you know, and watch other teams wrestle against his teams. Uh, although he didn't coach the high schools on those times, but he had guys who were club wrestlers who wrestled at the high school and on the Fargo team. You can see evidence of uh, him in them, you know, and I was really impressed. And I believe that if he does that same thing down at Navy, um, it'll be some really good things happening for Navy. So I'm, I feel good about it. Yeah, his, his mentality, I think, is the biggest thing that transfers to his athletes mm -hmm. and the physicality, obviously, but I think the mentality part of it is the biggest piece that, you know, if you're not exposed to it, it when you're young and then you suddenly see it when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, it's like sometimes it flips the switch, you know, and for these, these kids at a military academy, I think it, Carrie is like the perfect person to uh, build that program. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intangible, you know, when you look at, um, guys competing at the states or nationals or world championships, it's not much difference between um, their peers um, physically in right. most cases, you know, a lot of times conditioning and whatever. It's uh, what's in, in here and, and up here, like you talk about the mentality, it's the, it's the intangible pieces that um, is the difference. And uh, a friend of mine had written a book in uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, he was an All-American at um, Utah, and he was a Marine Corps, Corps coach. But he said, I'm going to write a book out and say, what is it that the champions have, whether you make a, become a national champion, a world champ, or Olympic champion? So he interviewed a ton of them through the years, up until that time frame. And I was one of those. And when he got through with the book, what it came out to be was saying, some of the questions were like, when you wrestled your opponent, um, how many times did you feel that your opponent was better than you on takedowns? Um, escapes, um, pin and combination, um, defense, all these different things. And so then when it was over, uh, on the majority of things, um, the champion said that the guys were better than they were 30 to 40 percent of the time. Mm. If that's the case, then how do they win? Okay. But these were the questions that really stood out. Um, of the guys you wrestled, how many of you felt were in better shape than you were? Zero. Right, <laughs> close to that. Um, how many of you think had a greater will to win than you did? Uh, zero. Um, those were all those intangibles there were the ones that was the difference between those who were standing on the podium. It wasn't, you know, the technique, right. and the physicality, how quick you were, you know, how strong you were and those kind of things. It was those intangibles that, uh, that were there with the very thing you were talking about to a certain extent. And I think, like you say, that, that, uh, uh, carry a help in that regard, I believe, you know, in those guys, because they, they want to try to emulate him. I mean, it just, he loses it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and their equalizers, like you said, like everything else, um, you have X number of coaches, they all know the same technique. They all have the same training plan, basically, mm -hmm. but the way you deliver it, the way you present it, mm -hmm. uh, the way you think that they're spoken to every day. Right. Yeah. I, I yeah. think that's a huge difference, at least my time around them, your time around, it sounds like, mm -hmm. and it's, it's huge. Yeah. So I'm excited. And I'm curious because you, you're talking about these intangible things. And a few weeks ago, we talked about your preparation for the 73 worlds where you won a, a gold medal, right. which mm -hmm. is amazing. You were the first African American to win a, a, any medal? Is it any medal, right? Uh, world medal. I think Bobby Douglas had won a silver or maybe some other medal in years prior in, uh, in freestyle in the world. So that, that's an amazing accomplishment. Number one, how did, how did that make you feel? Did you know it at the time? No. <laughs> I knew I was a world champion. <laughs> I'm guessing it wasn't until um, 15 years, maybe 20. My aunt called me on the phone and said, hey, Butch, Butch, Butch. You're, you're a question on Jeopardy or something like that, you know? Who was at first African-American to win a gold medal in wrestling? Oh. The first time that I guess I'd heard that. But I know it was really true or not, you know? So um, 
when I really realized it definitively was when um, I got invited back to the 2007 national championships and they were honoring African-Americans in the sport. And at that time, um, they talked about my being the first African-American to win a gold medal in uh, international style wrestling and freestyle wow. in case. Also- 30, the first, 30 years uh, later. Yeah, and Africa, the first time, first African-American to win um, a medal in the Olympics in wrestling, you know, where wow. I won the silver. You know, I was just blown away. I mean, all those years I competed and stuff, I knew there weren't a ton of us out there, but I wasn't even thinking that in a mindset. You know, I was right. thinking about just, just wrestling, you know what I mean? Right. And I mean, there were racial issues, you know, back then, but um, uh, was, I may have not shared, I shared with many people. I felt I was in a bubble during that time frame. I was just competing, you know, and right. I felt I was being treated like everybody else and even special right. treatment and all those kind of things, you know. So um, I know my, my peers, um, um, black wrestlers didn't have that same experience in some cases in talking with them. But for me, right. it was like, um, but still then I didn't realize it until, um, I mean, decades later. Yeah. I wasn't wrestling. To That's become, amazing. I wasn't wrestling. That's amazing. The first Af African-American to win a uh, medal or whatever. I was just wrestling to become a world champion and Olympic champion, <laughs> you know, and that was a whole, whole thing in my mind. Right. I didn't have a clue with the history. I didn't realize we didn't have a national champion until at that same event, I met uh, Simon, who was the first African-American to win a national championship in NCAAs. Um, I think it was 60s, what was it? In the late 50s, I believe it was. So I was really honored to meet him. And I got to meet, you know, Bobby Douglas back. I met Bobby earlier, but got to see him again, you know, sure. by his contribution. Amazing. Yeah. So 30 plus years later, and that must have been an amazing feeling of just like resurfacing everything because you, like you said, you're striving for Olympic and world medals and you're not thinking about, obviously people aren't striving for that, but it just must have resurfaced a lot of feelings about what happened there. And um, so here's my, the second part of that question is, um, you know, you, I think we, I think you had mentioned you, you only had a couple months to prepare because you had military duties right. and I'm curious, Number one, can you can you speak about that again? Because I thought that was just fascinating. And and when you talk about the intangibles, those are the things. That's those are the difference makers. The intangible things that that you're talking about earlier. And maybe that's what helped you with the with the little preparation that you had. But um, so that's part one. And then part two, seventy four, seventy five. Before that, let, tell me a little bit about your preparation for those those events. Well, I didn't compete in 74. I did compete in the uh, World Military Championship called the SISM Games in Rome, Italy. But um, 73, um, after the 72 trials, the Olympic team invited me to train with the team before we went to Munich. And the Marine Corps allowed me to do that to the latter part of that summer before they headed out. And um, so I didn't step on the mat again until, um, <laughs> I got a call that the Olympic Committee wanted me to represent the United States on the cultural exchange team to Tbilisi. Mm. And this is probably like in uh, November. And so I got called in by the CEO of the, um, of the basic school at the time. I was going through officer training uh, for a Marine Corps officer who's going to be, once he's commissioned, be trained to um, be a basic infantryman and then from that point on, you go train to be a specialty, you know, be it um, aviation, et cetera, et cetera. And this is so still got, part of your, your U.S. Naval Academy. Well, school. I graduated from Naval Academy, and then I uh, commissioned, I was commissioned as a Marine Corps officer. Gotcha. At that time, I was com competing for the, trying to make the Olympic team in, uh, that summer in 72. And then um, I didn't make it. I got, I was an alternate behind uh, Gable but they asked me to stay around for 29 days and train with them before the team headed to um, Munich. And wow. Marine Corps allowed me to do that. Once that happened, then I started my training as a Marine Corps officer. I see. And that started like, I think September and ended in like March. But in November, I'm in the middle of that, um, no activity to train or anything. And I get a call from the commanding officer stating that the Olympic Committee had invited asked the Marine Corps it'd be okay if I would come and represent the United States in Tbilisi. 
And the colonel said, I told him, hell no. <laughs> He's not leaving. He can't leave because right now, you know, you're in the middle of class and you can't really just pull sure. yourself out of there. You know what I mean? And so that was what I heard. But so then um, the latter part of December or after Christmas, I got called in again and said, and he said that basically um, um, we got word from the commandant at the Marine Corps that Butch will go to Russia. So <laughs> I packed my bags and I met the team up in New York and flew over there. I hadn't been on the mat since September. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so um, I wrestled in the Tbilisi tournament and uh, some, um, you know, the duels, you could do a little tour in the country afterwards. Sure. And I forget uh, that first match. I have a photo of it. Uh, Jim Peckham was in my corner and I forget who else was in the corner. They were fanning me down and I'm hanging, sitting on a chair and I just can't move. And they're holding <laughs> me up. That one just collapsed. I'm just so exhausted, you know? So I kind of wrestled myself in shape <laughs> during right. that tournament. I placed third, which was pretty darn good in the Tbilisi tournament. Sure, yeah. And, um, and then the rest of the year, um, so I didn't wrestle anymore again until uh, I went back, came back, went to basic school. They, they told me I couldn't go for the full 17 days, but I can go for 10 days. So I did the 10 days. I left the team over in um, the Soviet Union. I flew home by myself, you know, and rejoined my uh, class at the basic school. And that finished in March. Uh, just in time for the final wrestle loss for the all-Marine team. So I went straight from there, no training, to the All-Marine team and said, hope I can make it and wrestle myself in shape before the All-Service Championship. So I made the team. I, I, I was first place. And then the, the next week, I won the All-Service Championship, and that qualified me for the Nationals. And I think the next week was the National. Two weeks afterwards, um, I won the National Championship in freestyle. So that wow. qualified me for the World Team. So then I go back to uh, Quantico. So once I graduate from the base school, I'm at Officer Canada School at this point in time. Well, I'll be a platoon commander sometime, and sometime I'll be an instructor. So I'm in a class for learning how to become um, for military instru um, uh, military um, uh, instruction. So become an instructor. So I, I was there for a couple of months, and then I went to the final trials. And I said, what I'll do is I will depend upon the other guys wrestling off and during that week, I try to whip myself in the best shape that I can. So by the time it came time for me to wrestle off, I'll be in enough shape to be, you know, competitive. And it worked out for me. So I made wow. the world team and went over and I was always in really good shape because the Marine needed to be in good shape. But I mean, right. I ran yeah. and those kind of things. But as far as wrestling, it wasn't a wrestling. So I went over and won the world championship. Amazing. And then I came back and, um, um, that year, I felt that um, um, I was worn out. You know, I'd won the world championship. I'd been into the Blisi tournament. I won the national AAUs. And I was winning, winning, winning. And I felt that everybody was coming after me, you know. And, yeah. and I was getting everybody's national championship match. Your best thing, you know. And they wanted to beat me. And, and I said, I just need to take some time off. And plus, I needed, you know, attend to my career. So right. the Marine Corps set up a thing for me so that, I wouldn't be faced with 10 years down the road looking for a promotion if the only you have in your jacket is wrestling. Mm -hmm. So my monitor who determines my assignment said, we got this little thing I think will work for you. We're gonna get you a command time. So in summer of 74, uh, we have an opportunity for you to become a weapons platoon commander down in Camp Lejeune. I said, wow. okay. So I went down there, I had 65 guys in the platoon, it was, uh, rocket launchers, um, mortar, and machine guns, M60 machine guns. They were in my platoon. And so I was their platoon commander for about three and a half months. And we out, were out in the field the whole summer, you know, training them to get you know, as, as uh, polished as they possibly can in each one of the specialties and cross training them throughout the whole thing. One of the most rewarding um, experiences of my life, really. And so um, I even wrestled them on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you gotta, have it? Uh, huh? Did you have any wrestlers in there? No. Um, All non-wrestlers, just Na Naval Academy guys. Oh, or oh, no, these are, no, this is no Naval Academy guys. This is just regular Marine Corps at this point. Ah, um, nice. Real Marines, you know, real gunner sergeants, you know, and company commander. And I remember a guy came out to me and says, uh, we were on the beach at, you know, between one of the sessions and said, 
Uh, Lieutenant Keezer says, yeah, he says, they understand you are, excuse the expression, damn bad. <laughs> what do you mean? He said, you can get down. He said, can we go? I said, no, I can't, I can't do that, you know, because um, you don't want to wrestle or box enlisted because you put them in an awkward position, you know, um, sure. because if something happens to me as an officer, you know, it causes problems. I right. said, nah. but the colonel says, go ahead, uh, you know, commanding officers. So I went out there and I can almost, no effort, <laughs> put him on his back, right? Then they start lining up. <laughs> then they had the gunny. Of and course. then a team sergeant coming up, you know? One guy was coming like he's a boxer, you know, big guy or whatever. And I put them all on their backs, you know? It wasn't much effort for me to do. I must have had 20 guys come just lining up. Then after wow. that, I never had anybody, any problem with any guys in the company <laughs> or platoon. My fact platoon says, my captain, I mean, my lieutenant, <laughs> He's it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yep. so it, it was just one of the, it gave me a lot of respect. And I heard it spread throughout, you know, around the way through the world. I mean, not the world, but the Marine Corps, what happened. But they want somebody like that. They want somebody like that leading them, somebody yeah. that they know is tough and, and probably a lot better than them at, at mm -hmm. that combat stuff. And when you look at those guys, sometimes, you know, they, they were saying sometimes if I gave them an order or said something to them, they, they, you can see in their eyes, man. I wish you were an officer and we can go someplace. <laughs> you don't know, sometimes I was wish, wishing the same thing. <laughs> but, but anyway, so I, I, I spent um, the summer down there. And um, so when I came back, um, they had the SISM games that year. And so because I won the end of service, I qualified for that. So then we had like a week training camp before we went over. So I met with the team. I hadn't wrestled since... Um, March, I guess it was. Wow. Went over and I won the um, uh, SISM games. And then uh, 75, uh, I said, I'll start coming back. So that was like in November, I believe, of 74. So in 1975, I um, started wrestling with all Marine team in March. During that time, I was either a platoon commander or an instructor at Officer Canada School, no wrestling. And so, again, that same cycle, all Marine team, um, inner service champion, qualify for the nationals, go to the world camp. And um, that year, I got whooped by um, um, Gene Davis, bronze medalist from 73, uh, 72 mm -hmm. Olympic team in the nationals. So he was number one going to the camp, but he couldn't make it because his his wife was having a baby, so um, we didn't get a chance to wrestle off. So as a result, then by default, I got to wrestle in the 75 Worlds and the oh, Pan American wow. Games or whatever. So I um, won the um, Pan Ams and the 75 Worlds. Um, I was doing, um, I lost, I uh, lost a match to Pavel Pennington, really close match. And then, um, I'm believing that I'll probably have a silver medal. So uh, next match, I was winning 10 to 2. And uh, for some reason, I don't know what got into me. I know what got into me. Um, <laughs> I'd won a national champion in Greco, right? I'd only been wrestling Greco for two years of my life, right? Uh -huh. What made me, so the guy locked me up in an upper body position. And normally, I would do everything in my power to never get in that position or get out of it right away. But I had a little bit of comfort there, which mm. is the wrong move. Next thing I was flying through the air on a lateral drop um, <laughs> in a high bridge, and the match was over. I was beating like 10 to 2. He had like two cautions against him, you know, and so I was out of the, out of the, uh, the tournament. So I didn't place there. I really felt bad because um, it cost the team, you know, and that whole thing there. And I mm. felt I was a much better wrestler and those kind of things. I watched Valoe, my, my, my cardinal rule, just stay with what you're, you know, the best at. So, um, Right. So Greco helped me, you know, in my wrestling world. But then again, I wasn't, you know, I didn't believe um, metal worthy world class wrestler, you know, that thing. Right. And so um, that was in 75. And then 76 was a year that um, things were going to change because um, uh, wrestling came up with um, this program where we'll have three months after the nationals, three months for the top eight guys to train together to prepare for the Olympics. Now, wow. in 1972, I think it was like um, 
30 days, I guess it was, post-trials. This was 90 days prior to the trials. And then you try it for the team. You know, and that was really good. That, that was the first time in all the years that I wrestled where I had more than a month, you know, to really train and focus on it. So Marine Corps uh, allowed me and the Naval Academy um, to go to these camps. I uh, one in Brockport, New York. I mean, uh, was it Brockport, New York, DeKalb, Illinois, and um, University of Iowa. And so we were 30 days at each one of those, those camps. And then we had the final trials. And so in that case there, that three months was probably the most prepared that I was for uh, any, any international competition, any competition really, for that matter, you know, post college or whatever. Mm -hmm. So my typical pattern is um, um, a month and a month and a half, maybe two months at the most of wrestling, except for that Olympic year. That's amazing. Yeah. So you, did you feel much more prepared in the other years, or did you feel more confident? Um, I felt more, um, I really felt prepared in all the cases, but I realized that um, for the Olympic Games, um, um, I never lifted weights before. I decided to do circuit training, and I noticed I was doing it prior to uh, my getting to the training camps and while I was there, and I noticed a difference for me in the third period. I was always in great shape. But my endurance was even better from just doing the circuit training. I believe more in um, medium resistance and higher reps versus, you know, um, brute strength. I want to be able to be really strong in that third period. And then also on uh, technique wise, um, I've learned, I knew how, I learned how to defend things more and learn to fine tune some of my technique far more and just knocking heads with some of the best guys in the country in your weight class and above your weight class, you, you can't can't um, come close to replicating that in your own individual training, you know, outside. So, you know, iron on iron, that helped me be a much better wrestler. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And then you, you were the most prepared going into the trials. And was there another set of camps leading up to Montreal later um, on? No, once you, right after the trials, you were on the team. And shortly afterwards, we were heading to um, Montreal. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, all the stuff was done prior to. So we we're just basically fine tuning, um, you know. Um, right. What was, you didn't, and, and they would bring locals yeah. in at each location and we would not catch with them. Sometimes they would bring long lines in and then they we get out on the mats and <laughs> people come out of the stands <laughs> and take turns on us. Like we were like, you know, bull in the ring, you know, so you got to go after, get a piece oh. of everything, you know. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. I mean, sometimes, you know, when people do that kind of stuff, there's a chance for getting hurt. But uh, uh, most folks were pretty solid. Most of them were, you know, half decent wrestlers. So uh, it worked out okay. And yeah, and you hope that they, they realize that they're there to help you prepare, not to obviously hurt you and ding you up before, before that yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so. But it was all those, I mean, I wouldn't, um, so when I, Stop wrestling. Um, I was not hurt career-wise as far as what was in my uh, jacket. Matter of fact, I was getting promoted pretty quickly along the way. You know what I mean? Because I had command time with the Western platoon. Um, I taught at Officer Canada School, where most people go away to like Vietnam or some other place, and they come back after they've been in the Marine Corps for a while and become an instructor. And I kind of did that like a ahead of schedule in a way. So. Um, even during the, I wrestled in a um, Southern Open. I had been on the mat for like two months. And I said, I'm going, told my wife. And um, so instead of going at 150, I wrestled 158. So I had to lose three pounds on the way down there, entered the tournament, and I, this isn't in just regular collegiate wrestling, and I won that, won that tournament, you know. And so, uh, it was kind of stupid on my part because I wasn't in shape, you know, whatever. I started doing old man techniques, you know, so I managed to win. But um, after that point, I said, I will not enter a tournament unless I have been training and in shape. Right. I heard somebody in the stand say, he's a world's champion. I felt embarrassed. My, I won, but I felt embarrassed about my performance. I said, I'll never do that again. So I would do stuff like that, you know, because I really wanted to compete. But right. you know, the situation was such that I didn't have a chance to do that. 
So this free, I did it on my own weekend, which happened to be like a, um, you know, Thanksgiving weekend. So I had time off. So I just, just go, <laughs> you know. So. And then after Montreal? Um, that was before. I'm thinking it was like 70 four or five somewhere in there i can't uh, remember right yeah mm-hmm. well montreal you won the gold medal and neil tells me this story whenever i talk to neil edelberg he is he's just obviously fascinated by your story as well and i know you guys have known each other for a long time but he always tells me the story of ed Peary and his dad rex and neil and guy zanti and some out st joe guys driving to winnebago up to montreal and checking camping out by the olympic village and he told me he's always saying how you got you walked him through the village and how they were just just they were on cloud nine Mm -hmm. how did you feel about seeing all them did you know they were coming did you know they were going to camp out there uh i didn't know any of that (laughs) wow you know um it was uh but it didn't it it wouldn't didn't surprise me especially you know coach and, and neil you know uh, it was uh, the whole experience, an overwhelming experience. You know, I mean, I knew Coach since mm-hmm. sophomore year in high school, and we'd done camps together. He did the camps, and I was up there as a high schooler, you know, working uh, on scholarship, cleaning dishes, uh, mats, taking out trash, and that kind of stuff. I couldn't afford to pay for wrestling camp, you know, back in those years. Sure. We, we did camps together, and his father uh, a couple times picked me up and drove me up in the mountains to uh, places, whatever. So I've known them a long time, you know, and then Neil, you know, later in life, knowing him over the years and, you know, and, and just, just seeing them there and knowing that um, my support was just unbelievable. People mm-hmm. physically being there. My um, brother was there. Uh, one of my sisters was there. Couldn't get my mom to go because she couldn't stand and watch me wrestle and says, you should go up there, do your thing, and just tell me what happens afterwards and don't get hurt. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then um, – Live streaming back then, so yeah. you had to <laughs> – And then my um, roommate um, at the Olympic Village was an alternate on the team. We went to high school together. Two black boys from um, wow. Park High School said so we want to go to the Olympics. He was two years younger than I was, and, and people laughed at us, you know. So he just missed it by one – slot and I was there you know wow. and seeing you know coach and Neil and those guys you know they're like family you know what I mean right. um was just a, a special thing and um I just got overwhelmed um maybe not near presence but I know um, um not only I was getting um telegraphs you know we didn't have <laughs> email back in those days <laughs> western union things come right. across you know I got a couple phone calls uh, from people out of the blue, all walks of my life, you know, and to see them there physically, um, I get goosebumps now just thinking about it. Um, and I know that um, um, the biggest thing I did not want to do was to cause any embarrassment to anybody there. I want to be able to represent, you know, my um, family, um, my community, you know, those guys, um, the Marine Corps, you know, all those eyes out there, you know, and I felt I was a photo on a cloud, you know, so it just, um, having that, that support, you know, seeing them be able to touch them, hug them, you know, yeah. they're in your corner, it's, it's a big deal. You yeah. don't feel um, isolated. I felt more pressure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a good thing, you know, it's um, uh, having, you know, a coach and a coach and I for so many years, it's just, um, it was a special moment for me to see those guys Mm -hmm. that's amazing people always say wrestling is you know an individual sport but you're talking about all these people that were in your corner and it's amazing because it's a giant support system that helps you get there and the relationships that you create through wrestling are just for myself is just amazing and yeah Mm -hmm. sure for you as well i mean hearing hearing that story and people that have met you and the way they talk about their interactions with you as well and and yours vice versa it's just it sounds like it's just amazing amazing time and, and experience beyond you know beyond that medal that you're holding right i'm goosebumps the whole time you're talking there not really and when i was really it's uh um it never gets old and, and to me that's the um it never the gets tangible old. piece that i was talking about 
Right. The medals are nice. The trophies are nice. The Hall of Fame is nice, and all those things, you know. But um, those experiences, I just wouldn't trade them for nothing in the world. You know, right. Really. Um, but anyway. <laughs> That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. Well, '76. You're at. It sounds like it was like the pinnacle, and then really, I, I know the last time we spoke. You had mentioned you didn't know really know what you wanted to do, and then 1980 came, the 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 boycott oh, yeah. here. And how did you feel about that? I know, I don't know. Like you were in the in the military, did were you afraid that you had to go somewhere? Um, were you still debating on competing that year? What, what um, were your feelings? Where were you? I I was out of the Marine Corps as of 1977, so three years prior. Um, I left uh, the Naval Academy for Big Blue, IBM. Mm. Um, but first I left it for FBI. <laughs> oh, nice. I had uh, signed up for FBI, and I was scheduled to go to their first, first class for the agents. would have been in January of 78. Um, IBM offered me a position and said that um, – I need to start in September of 77. So me, I'm saying, hmm, let me go and try IBM and see if I can like going out and be in the business world. And I know that I can always got, you know, FBI. So FBI would call me for the next couple of years and say, you're coming, you're coming. And I said, no, I'm still staying with IBM, you know? So um, I, I did that. And then um, um, what happened was I got out of the Marine Corps and um, was in the civilian world and IBM knew what I had done, mm -hmm. you know, and um, they had made it known to me if I had a desire to compete in 80, um, they would work with me. You know what I mean? This is unsolicited. And I was just oh. pleased. I said, nah, I made a commitment to my ex-wife that um, 1976 was it, period. Although I did tell her I violated that when I came back in 1977 and wrestled in the all-service championship because the Marine Corps thought they had a chance finally to beat Army in the combined when I uh -huh. we still lost to him by two points. So my last match was in the inner service in um, March or April of 77. So um, I'd been out of the Marine Corps for all those years. I've been following the sport just a little bit. You know, I was just trying to get my foot uh, um, in solid footing in the, in the business world. Sure. And um, I was so glad that I had not um, decided to compete. I really felt that I was just starting to learn how to wrestle in the 76 Olympic games. Wow. I thought if I wrestled 80 and 84, those would be my better years. I really did. I mean, wow. And um, I tried to commun communicate people, communicate to so many people how um, the more you wrestle, the more you don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah that's and, very true. Um, and so I really felt that 80 would have been my best um, year. And I know that age-wise that even though I thought 84, who knows, you start to go downhill after that point. I was 27, 26 when I competed in the Olympics. So I would have been 30 and 34 back in those days. A lot of international wrestlers were of those age, you know, right. you know 20, Brilliant. 27 and up. Yeah. So, um, but I really felt for those guys who, you know, went through all they went through and didn't get an opportunity to compete. I know they had the goodwill games, but that's not the same thing as the Olympics, you know. And I know I would have been crushed if I had uh, that taken away from me doing all that training. But as yeah. a military person, if I was still in, um, I kind of divorced myself from what was happening on the outside. I'd sign up to um, um, follow the leadership in the Marine Corps, President of the United States, to do what's appropriate, you know. And um, um, I may disagree. But here's what I signed up for. So as long as I sign up for that, then I'm going to do my job. You know what I mean? Right. It was an illegal order. That's a whole different story. But it was a legal order, and I am. So I had to kind of push that aside, especially during those times. I was doing the uh, racial strikes. And I was mm -hmm. wondering, they're going to call us in, like the National Guard, and says, what am I going to do if they do that? And I might be standing across the line from uh, one of my best buddies, you know, mm -hmm. who was a, a real strongly um, in, uh, activist. What am I going to do? You know, and I, I dreaded those moments. You know, right. but the other ones, um, not, not as much. I didn't know how I was going to perform if I were in battle and bullets are flying my way and I'm going to cower or whatever. 
nobody knows until that moment actually happens. You can train right. for it, you can speculate on it. Yeah. But many times who guys who be like uh, Joe Hero in training and all the kind of stuff, when the bullets start flying, they're like whipping babies and little mini mouse over here who like a peep squeak becomes like a war hero. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so I, that's the biggest question I had was, uh, what kind of guy would I be when that battle came? But I want to prepare myself best I could. So um, um, I didn't really dig as deep in the, that. Same thing in 76 when they had the um, uh, political activity going on there, you know, with the uh, uh, right. African nation was going to pull out and those kind of things. And right. and being interviewed, and I said, all I got, I'm here on the Olympic team for the United States. I got to focus <laughs> all my energies on what's happening here because I start expending energy elsewhere that's going to reduce my chance of being as um, best prepared and ready when I, when I was there. So um, I really felt for um, a lot of my peers, you know, Kemp back in those years, Yeager mm -hmm. back in those years, people that I knew, you know, during my era who were getting their shot and that shot was just, it's gone. You know, yeah. Whatever. Oh. You're talking about four years. Of I mean, that's that's a long time to long time. Eight eight years, some cases for some of those who finally made the made the team. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. amazing, yeah. amazing. And I, yeah, I can't even I can't even un like begin to understand what that would have been like. Even for like in Munich when all that stuff was happening, mm -hmm. the terrorist attacks, and they still have to focus. And you know, Gable obviously was the big story that year yeah, and yeah, you yeah. were you in munich with him uh, no the um guys who would have been alternates per se did not travel with the team they only sent the team over that year now in canada they sent the top three alternates um oh. and put them up in canada uh, for those who wanted to go uh, which was a good deal but for munich that that was not the case mm -hmm. wow but i trained with them for you know um 30 29 days up in um Minneapolis, St. Paul, and that was a great experience in, in itself. Wow! And now this year, it seems like it's a boycott year, but it's it's really not. It's a coronavirus year. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll have an Olympic year in 2021. What's your What are your feelings and thoughts on? Do you still follow wrestling up to today, and, and who our superstars are? Um, to a certain extent, I, I I try to go to the nationals most years. Um, I have a subscription to uh, Amateur Wrestling News, and uh, when the matches are shown up on TV, up on Big Ten Network, I'll take a take a, a peek at it, and um, I'll follow the Navy guys, you know, quite naturally. Um, it's um, um, I just don't know what this virus thing is going to hold. <laughs> you know, nope, we're in a sport. You know, you can't get up any closer than we are. Yeah, you know, we're closer than what the football people are. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. And so, um, I don't know. Um, have you heard where there's any kind of competition coming up? The Russian Nationals, right now, they're, they have the Rush, junior Russian Nationals going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. They just canceled the seniors. The seniors, okay. I think, are supposed to be next weekend. Mm -hmm. They just they either canceled it or postponed it, but, yeah, it's crazy. U.S. has an event. This upcoming weekend, Beat the Streets, which mm -hmm. is amazing, mm -hmm. that they're going to get that off. But I think if you have strict protocols around it, they seem, they've seem they had, I think, two or three events this year. And each one, they must have strict protocols for each one. And they're learning. They're learning mm -hmm. how to make them better. They're learning mm -hmm. how to contain mm -hmm. and obviously test to make sure, you know, the athletes are good. But, you know, on a larger scale, that's a small scale on a larger scale, who knows? Yeah, 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 I, I, I don't know. It's just so many unknowns, you know, and um, I can see where you can probably manage it, you know, like some of these events here, but when you're talking about, you know, the Olympics, um, I guess, you know, with having it without um, fans per se, you know, um, and keeping it contained like in a bubble, so like the basketball players are doing and that kind of stuff, I could see potentially that happening and then having really superior testing along, <laughs> along the way. You know, what would happen if, you know, when our sport, you don't have substitute, right? So then in that case, we need to have uh, um, an alternate there, a true alternate available to step in potentially, you know, for, for team, I would think. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. So, so I would like to see something happening, you know, but uh, I can only imagine what, you know, um, they're dealing with down at Navy, you know, all the other collegiate programs, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, you know, those yeah. high school wrestlers coming in, they're going to make their big um, um, splash in the sport. You know, Navy, you don't get that extra year. If you don't wrestle uh, that year, right. that's, that's, that's right. bye-bye. <laughs> you know, some other colleges, you know, where somebody may come um, there and do it on the five-year program or the six-year program, maybe it's four and out. There's a very rare case, usually with some kind of injury or illness or something, that you may extend it beyond that. But other than that, you know, that's it. Right. That That's the biggest thing. I this thing is posing everybody we have to learn to pivot and and find another way to get things done i, yeah, I think that's yeah. the only way we can we can continue moving on i think we can't control it we don't know what's gonna happen and so yeah i really appreciate your time butch one question before we two questions yeah. before we go. Where did you get the nickname Butch, if I may ask? Because I don't know. I call you Butch sometimes. I call you Lloyd sometimes. Well, when I got invited to Hall of Fame and people would come to him and say, since when you become Butch? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, my mom always loved the nickname Butch. I was a firstborn male in my family, one of seven. And uh, my youngest baby brother is 15 years younger. But she liked the name Butch. So at three months old, I got a nickname Butch. Wow. So I went to high school and everybody knew me as Lloyd. And until they heard some people in the community call me Butch, they started dropping Lloyd and started calling me Butch. To Naval Academy, my name was Lloyd. And then when family came to visit, they heard Butch and people start using Butch. You know, and the papers start using Butch sometimes. And same thing in the Marine Corps. So typically, when I joined IBM, I was Lloyd. And then um, uh, some of the businesses would call the office and the secretary says, new ones, who hadn't been there in a while, says, uh, I don't know about Butch, but we got Lloyd's here. Maybe uh, Lloyd is Butch's brother. So I changed my business card to have Lloyd Butch Keys on there. And I tell all my customers, nice. call me what you feel comfortable calling me. Because some of them says, I can't call you Butch. I have to call you Lloyd. You know what I mean? And that's where it's been. So people who, most people who, who feel it's okay to call me Butch and don't insist to call me Lloyd, um, if they're not one of those folks, then typically you can tell who knows me. If they call me Lloyd, I see. So most people drop, they, they like to use Butch, whatever. I try to drop it over the years, but I haven't been successful. <laughs> so yeah, I always find my name, Lloyd Butch Keezer. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. I use one of those. Nice. And yeah, again, I really appreciate your time, Butch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I value the opportunity to, that we had to work together with Team Maryland back in, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And I learned a lot from you. I still learn from you to this day, and, and I really appreciate that. And I wondered if there's one last thing you could offer any young athletes, you know, looking to make a jump. Uh, you know, we keep talking about those intangible things. Um, any, anything you, you can offer? I got a long list of things, but um, a couple things that stuck with me ever since I was a little kid. Uh, my dad always says, uh, do as the hen do the best you can do. If you do that, you will go a long ways. I learned long things. Say, look at that man in the mirror and do the best you can all all times, you know. And the other thing is that if you lose or mess something up, he always says, doesn't mean you can't do it. I mean, you don't have to do it at that moment. Try to right. figure out what was wrong and come back and just work on that, you know. Right. And then you can, if you can look at yourself, man in the mirror and say, every time, no matter what I do, um, did I do the best I could do? And the only person can answer, you know, you know, coach is not going to tell you, mom and dad not going to coach, you know whether you gave it the best. The other little the other thing, too, was there's no such thing as uh, 110% or 120%. No. The maximum is 100%. So That's look right. at here, did I give 70%, 80%, 90%? It's always work towards getting to that 100%. And the, those little things, believe, believe me, carried me a long ways. And then later in life, um, so much uh, is, uh, I wish I knew this when I wrestled. I did a camp and uh, there were about six guys at the camp and we all wrestled one another. So after the session was over, we were taking it. They sat me down and they can say, we'll tell you why you won. <laughs> you're right. He says, you're pretty good, you know, your technique and all condition, all that kind of stuff. We were just good too. But the real reason why you won is because you wrestled every second of every match. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, there were about six matches I lost, and I realized I didn't do that. 
I, I was going, I was protecting the lead I didn't have and those kind of things. And I realized after the fact, you know, they told me after I stopped my career that the minute that I start protecting the lead, I'm not using my best wrestling capacity. And for me, it was, I was being aggressive. Sure. And, that, and that lose a window for the other person to come in. So that really weakens my defense. And so the big thing was um, I stressed over and over again, no matter what skill level you are, wrestle every second of every match. And I'll tell you why. 10 seconds of my wrestling career resulted in a world championship, a national Greco championship, <laughs> national freestyle championship. I won the world championship with two points close to the buzzer. Wow. Okay. I won the national Greco championship almost two points at the buzzer with a throw. I won the national freestyle championship with two points almost at the buzzer, uh, less than a total of 10 seconds. If I was on wrestling every second of every match, I wouldn't be here sitting talking to you right now. Right? That's amazing. No. And so, um, um, I, that's perspective. Huh? That's deep perspective. That's, that's deep perspective. Oh yeah. Yeah. It yeah. makes it more real to, to, when you say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, so that there, and the last one I would say is, um, it's like a chicken and egg thing. Belief, right? I believe I can win an Olympic medal. Which comes first, that belief or doing the things you need to do to have that belief? Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, I believe it's a combination. Because sophomore year in high school, my coach taught me I can go a long ways. He thought I had potential to become an All-American. And who knows? He thought I had potential to become an Olympian or something. You know, I didn't know what that stuff was. So he explained to me what it was, sophomore year in high school. And so wow. I said, how do you do that? So he, he laid a little path out for me to go to wrestling camps, you know, this, get some competition, go to college, get experience. You know, you're not going to be experienced internationally. Then when you graduate, it might take a couple of years, you know, maybe in – 1976, um, you might have a chance to be in there if you continue on the same trajectory. I'm saying, okay, I want to become an Olympian. So I started telling everybody I want to go to the Olympics, sophomore year in high school. And everybody was just laughing at me, right, in my high school. Senior year, no one had a doubt except for one person, me. But the whole time, I kept saying, I know what it took. And I knew I wasn't close to being an Olympian. But what was happening was I just focused on that little ladder. Let me take a little step here. Let me try to win a county championship. Oh, I won that, you know. Let's see if I get that region. I won that, you know. And I didn't look any further than that. Just, you know, every day, practice. And it was like going this ladder. Next thing I know, I'm an Olympic champion. I don't know how I got there. It was such a gradual process, you know what I mean? But what mm -hmm. I found was each time I start winning here, winning there, winning there, I could really envision myself being on that stand. Before, it was kind of really fuzzy. I kind of wish it was right. there. You know? So the more I applied myself, be a sponge and learn as much as I can from everybody who can show me how to get there, the stronger that belief got. And the more I applied myself, the stronger the belief got. And just kept building and building and building. So my belief is if you don't believe that you can get there, you're not getting there. You know what I mean? Right. So my belief is that I don't know how to get there, but my coach kind of knows. Right. This guy won a state championship kind of knows. We pull from them. And learn everything I can do. If I just follow that mindset all the way through, you'll continue to grow, grow, grow. The minute you feel you, you're there, you got it, you made it, you're not going to maximize your potential. And the chances you're getting there are probably going to be not that great. Unless you're that rare individual who is just so dominant <laughs> in spite of not having any skill and whatever, which is rare in the sport of wrestling. Yeah, mm -hmm. very rare. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So that's yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and the, I think that you hit a – you know, the last thing you hit a good point, you know, all those people that you pull from, they're helping you climb the ladder. And then there's, okay. an, there's another ladder at the next Avenue. And then there's another one. And yeah. Yeah. that's what it sounds like your career. It was just, you had that constant belief. You, yeah. you were leaning on good people that could help you climb the ladder at each Avenue, at each event, each mm -hmm. juncture. And you just took full advantage. I mean, that's amazing, amazing career, amazing, uh, I'm here with Lloyd Butch Keezer. We're finishing up our interview and again, really value, uh, value your time. And um, I hope, you know, many people can learn more about you and 
maybe we can get another chance to sit down like this. I mean, I'm always learning from you too. Okay. All right. Appreciate it there. And uh, I, um, I feel I learned something every day, you know what I mean? And I, yeah. I learned from you as well. And I will continue to be a sponge until the, the day that I die. I mean, that's we have to I have to be, mm -hmm. we have to. All right, Butch, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Okay. You too. You too Take man. care. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. Let me see.